What is up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. These are my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC 302. We have Isla Mahachev going against Dustin Poirier. We are back after a one-week break, and we're diving right back into it with a really good card here. UFC 302, headlined by Isla Mahachev, Dustin Poirier. We got the co-main event, Sean Strickland, Paulo Costa, which is a five-round non-title fight, and just a lot of really good fun fights uh, throughout the card. So really looking forward to it, looking forward to breaking it down, talking it through. Before we do so, if you guys could like the video, subscribe to the channel if you have not already i'm getting really close to 25k subs like less than 400 away so if you guys have not subscribed and you guys do enjoy the content please be sure to subscribe and since this is a pay-per-view card as always i'm bringing back the significant strike contest to enter the contest first like the video second subscribe and third comment down how many significant strikes you think that islam mahachev and dustin Poirier are going to combine for uh, whoever gets closest 25 dollars to first if there's a tie the tiebreaker does go to the person that commented first and then if you do get it on the dot on money i'm going to double the prize to 50 dollars. so be sure to comment down those significant strike guesses it's been a while since somebody's got it right on the dot so we'll see if one of you guys can can get it this saturday other than that i do want to shout out dfs by the numbers.com this is absolutely the best place to support me this is where i do the majority of my content the content you do not see on youtube uh, the most popular option is that ten dollar betting tier with that you get access to all the stats you see on the friday saturday shows first notice on all bets i do have three bets thus far i uh, placed them nice and early three totals for this week um i do multiple articles i do a best bet article where i do the the prediction the method um the confidence rating and the best bet for each and every fight and then i do a final betting article on friday where i break down all my tracked bets and then do a prelim main card and hail mary parlay and just a ton of other content prize uh prize picks content as well I do a prize picks article and a prize picks entry and then dana white's contender series is going to be coming up uh, very shortly as well so i'm going to be adding that uh, for no extra charge if you guys want to support me that is absolutely the best way to do it uh, i don't know if you guys have heard but i did get let go from pub sports radio so i'm going to be bringing some content um, new content onto this channel that was uh, recently on pub we did stat diggers on sunday on this channel it's going to be on here going forward for the foreseeable future and then thinking about maybe doing like another live stream on wednesday potentially so just be on the lookout for that um and then just lastly i know it's a long long-winded breakdown but it's been a while i do want to shout out the sponsor of the show prize picks i'm gonna be talking about some plays that are sticking out nice and early if you guys want to check out prize picks use promo code dfsbtn and you'll get a 100 deposit match up to 100 dollars. it helps me out helps you out it's free money check it out use that promo code all right with all that out of the way i say we get right into it and we're going to start with the first fight of the card and we have andre lima taking on mitch raposo we got andre lima 25 years old five foot seven with a 67 and a half inch reach eight and no and five and no in his last five fights we got mitch raposo 25 years old five foot five with a 64 and a half inch reach nine and one and four and one in his last five fights so this is going to be andre lima's uh, third different opponent um, he was supposed to originally fight somebody that dude pulled out another dude stepped in he had to pull out and then in steps Mitch Raposa who I am very familiar with because we saw him fight in the tough house he lost to uh, Ludovic Shalinian and then we saw him fight on the contender series where he lost to Jake Hadley so yeah looking into this fight we have um, Lima as a pretty decent sized favorite he opened up minus 250 he's currently sitting as a, uh, a minus 235 favorite. And then Mitch Raposa opened at plus 210. He's currently a plus 205 underdog. And I, I think this fight's pretty close, to be honest. Like, I know Andre Lima made his debut against Igor Severino, and um, that fight was really close. It was a back-and-forth fight. Both guys landed good shots in the feet. Severino was able to take down... Um, Andre Lima multiple times in that fight I think it was like six times in that fight and there was the whole thing with like the bite of the night right where Severino bit Andre Lima Severino got disqualified and cut from the UFC and Lima got a disqualification win but like I said that fight was you know kind of competitive up until then and there was so much cheating in that fight you know like um, Severino was biting Lima and then Lima grabbed the cage like six times I kid you not like uh, I thought I thought you know the ref was gonna stop the fight for one of those cage grabs, but it ended up being that that bite. But he he did grab the cage like six times, so a lot of cheating in that fight. This is a fight where 
I think it's close. I think it's competitive. I really do like the striking of Lima, but Mitch Raposo has some very fast hands. He's very quick, has sneaky power as well. And where I think Raposo can make this fight a little bit interesting is is the wrestling. I don't think Andre Lima's takedown defense is that great. So, um, But Andre Lima's grappling, I think, is really good. I think he's a brown belt or a black belt at this point. So, yeah, in a, in a fight that I do think is going to play out close competitively, the striking, I think, is going to be fairly competitive. Uh, probably edge of Lima there, but I think Raposa can mix in some takedowns. I'm going to take Raposa to win a very, very close decision here. But yeah, I like both these guys. I think both these guys have some solid upside um, in the division. Moving on, we got Eileen Perez going against Jocelyn Edwards. We got Perez, 29 years old, five foot five, with a 66 inch reach, nine and two, and four and one in her last five fights. Jocelyn Edwards, 28 years old, five foot eight, with a 70 inch reach, 13 and five, and three and two in her last five fights. Eileen Perez, the favorite. Opened up minus 250, currently minus 185, and then Jocelyn Edwards opened up plus 200, and she is currently sitting as a plus 160 underdog. And to be honest, I more so agree with that opener. I feel like Perez should be a, a bigger favorite here just because of the matchup, right? Like Eileen Perez, um, I don't think she's the best fighter in the world, but she's good at you know one thing, and that one thing is like the wrestling. The wrestling's been very good thus far. She went out there, she took down Ashley Evan Smith ten times in that fight. She went out there, took down Lucy Putalova uh, twice in their fight as well. Um, she was able to take down Stephanie Egger once as well. Um, yeah, she's a good wrestler, and once she gets on top, she's very hard to get off of you. And so I'm looking into this match, and I'm just like, okay, Perez, she can definitely wrestle. She's very physically strong. And then you take a look at Edwards, and it's like, Anytime somebody tries to take her down, they do, and they have a ton of success doing so. And then there's this stat that stuck out to me that yeah, is really worrisome on the Edwards side. It's like between the Jessica Rose Clark fight, the Carol Hosa fight, and the Lucy Putalova fight, and those three fights combined, she was controlled for over 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Um, you know, Carol Hosa controlled her for 11 minutes. Uh, Jessica Rose Clark, which is crazy which is, that's crazy, controlled her for 11 minutes. I mean, what would Eileen Perez do to, to Jessica Rose Clark? And then even Lucy Putalova in a fight where Jaws and Edwards won, uh, Lucy Putalova was able to control her for 7 minutes and 29 seconds, half the fight. So it's like, stylistically, I think it's a really good matchup for Eileen Perez. I think she'll be able to get takedowns here, no problem. Obviously, in terms of the striking, you favor Edwards, but you know Perez should be able to get this fight down to the mat. The worry is... The crooked, corrupt judges. I think this fight does go to decision. Um, and maybe, you know, their whole damage over control type situation where maybe Edwards lands a couple good shots on the feet, but Perez gets a bunch of control time. So something like that could present itself. And there are a couple wins for Edwards that I, I didn't think she really won. Um, so, yeah, it could get a little bit sketchy, you know, going to decision with these, these terrible judges. But I think Perez will go out here and get... Um, at least 10 minutes of control time, a uh, few takedowns, and ultimately win this fight by decision. It's going to be Perez, and I'll take her to win by decision. And then on prize picks, I'm liking the Perez more than 2.5 takedowns. She's averaging almost five takedowns per 15 minutes, and she's going against Jocelyn Edwards, who was taken down five times by Jessica Rose Clark. I don't think I need to say anymore. I mean, that's 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 pitiful. Carol Hosa uh, took her down four times as well. So I think Perez goes out there and gets at least three. One in each round makes sense, but I think there's opportunity for more. So if you guys want to check that out, promo code DFSBTN on Price Picks. Moving on, we have Basil Hafez going against Mickey Gall. We got Hafez, 32 years old, 5'11", with a 72-inch reach, 8-4, and four, and 3-2 and two in his last five fights. Mickey Gall, 32 years old, 6'2", uh, with a 74-inch reach, 7-5, and five, and 2-3. and three in his last five fights. So this is the fight on the card where I'm least looking forward to it from a betting perspective because really I just I just want nothing to do with this fight. This fight's kind of sketching me out. Mickey Gall, we haven't seen him in over two years. And I think he's been battling some injuries. Um, and then you got Hafez who made his debut against Jack Della Maddalena on short notice. And it's one of those fights where I, I talk about it all the time. We overrate these fighters in a loss. So Hafez went out there and, and lost the fight, and he clearly lost. I know it was a split decision. I know some people think that Hafez won the fight. I mean, damage over control, right? I mean, only one guy did damage in that fight, and it was Jack Della. I thought Jack Della cleanly won the fight, especially re-watching it. Um, so yeah, I think Hafez lost the fight, but his stock kind of skyrocketed. People are excited about this guy now because he he did better than expected against against Jack Della Maddalena. But and then I'm watching some of his other fights outside the UFC, and it's like he's he's losing exchanges to guys like Anthony Ivey and 
His his cardio doesn't look the greatest. He's he's looking tired in pretty much every single fight. Um, I don't know, but what I will say is he has a lot of heart. I think his wrestling's decent, and I think he has potential to win some minutes on top here against Mickey Gall, who who just folds like a lawn chair anytime you try to take him down. So I don't know. Uh, I don't really want to uh, to pick Mickey Gall. Um, it's hard to pick Mickey Gall to win a UFC fight. I mean, take a look at some of the guys he's he's beat, and it's just just terrible guys like. Like CM Punk, Mike Jackson. I mean, some of Mickey Gall's wins have to be the worst wins you, you'd ever see. Um, the dude's seven and five, two year layoff, multiple injuries. I can't do it, but at the same time, I'm not laying anywhere near minus 300 on Basil Hafez. But I'm going to take Hafez. Probably gets takedowns, probably gets control time. Mickey Gall's takedown defense is non existent, and I think Hafez can kind of tough his way out of. Some submission attempts from Gaul, um, and probably win a decision. So give me Basil Hafez to win this fight, and win this fight by decision. Moving on. We have a fun fight here. We have a rematch. We got Alex Morono going against Nico Price. We got Alex Morono, 33 years old, 5'11", with a 72-inch reach, 24-9, 3-2 in his last five fights. Nico Price, 34 years old, 6' foot with a 76-inch reach, 15-7, and, and one three in one no contest in his last five fights. Alex Morono opened up minus 300, currently minus 220. Nico Price opened up as a plus 250 underdog. He's currently plus 185. So, like I said, this was a rematch. Their first fight was a while ago. I think it was back in 2017. And in that fight, Alex Morono had a very good, really round and a half, I'd say. Uh, he went out there and, and pretty much dominated Price in the first round. He dropped him like mid to, to early in the first round and then dropped him bad late in the first round. And uh, looked like Price kind of got saved by the bell there. And then the second round comes around and uh, Morono's also having some success in that second round. And then at the end of the round, with a couple seconds left, Nico Price lands a big shot and he knocks out Morono cold. And Morono's just like laying against the cage, knocked out cold. The ref, I don't think, even realizes until like a couple seconds after and he kind of was there for a while but yeah brutal knockout win for nico price that did get turned into a no contest because nico price popped for that marijuana uh which he did also pop for that marijuana against uh donald cerrone uh, which that turned into a no contest as well so yeah this is a fight where i think it's um the thing for me here is i think nico price as as sad as it is to say is kind of on his way out and it's crazy to say that because the guy's only 34 but in fight years um, he's like 100. I mean, this is a guy that every single Nico Price fight is an absolute war. Do you guys remember that Vicente Luque fight where his eye was just busted open, swollen? Oh, my gosh. It was it was, it was was terrible. And he was yelling at the camera. Um, all these fights. I mean, they're war. The Jeff Neal fight, that was a war. Uh, Michelle Prayer was back and forth. That Phil Rowe fight was a war. Nico Price was looking great early and then, you know, started to gas out. And Phil Rowe knocked him out brutally in that third. And then the icing on the cake is is that last fight against Robbie Lawler. I was there live. I picked Robbie Lawler with zero confidence. Because how could you be confident in Robbie Lawler? His retirement fight, he was 41. And Nico Price gets flatlined in 38 seconds against Robbie Lawler. It, it still makes no, no sense to me. Um, but it just goes to show you that Nico Price, I, I think the chin is uh it's not there anymore this is a guy that used to have a chin I, I don't think it's there he's taking so much damage that damage is adding up and uh, i'm worried about him um yeah so yeah he's only 34 but like i said in fight years it's, it's 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 a lot it's a lot so uh for that reason i absolutely have to go alex morono here um and i think it's gonna be a fun fight i've i've never seen a boring nico price fight and i don't think that changes here and really i, I haven't really seen many boring alex morono fights because alex morono Wants to go out there and do the exact same thing as Nico Price, and that's stand and bang, which I think these two are going to do. So I'm going to take Alex Morono. I think he's definitely um, not washed. I think he has you know better durability, and I think he knocks out Nico Price. I think he returns the favor here uh, seven, seven, eight years later and knocks out Nico Price, and I think it's probably early as well. If you're getting knocked out by Robbie Lawler in 30 seconds, I don't know what to tell you. So I'm taking Alex Morota to win this fight, and I'll say it's a really fun, really fun fight, but um, I think it ends with Alex Morota getting the first-round knockout. Moving on, we have Jake Matthews going against Phil Rowe. And yeah, this is a very interesting fight. Uh, we got Jake Matthews, 29 years old, 5'11", with a 72-inch reach, 19-7, and 2-3 and and in his last five fights. Phil Rowe, 33 years old, 6'3", with an 80-and-a-half-inch reach, 10-4, and 3-2 and and in his last 
five fights. Jake Matthews opened up minus 115, currently minus 160. Phil Rowe opened up minus 105. He's currently plus 140. I don't trust either of these guys. I mean, Jake Matthews is one of the most inconsistent fighters in the UFC for me. I mean, there's some fights where he shows up and he looks incredible. It's like, wow, that's a that's a brand new Jake Matthews. I mean, this is a guy, this guy looks good. He's made so many improvements, right? And then there's times Jake Matthews shows up and it's like, what the heck? What the heck, Jake? What, what, are, you, what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing out there? Um, so I don't know, you know, he's, he's a really tough guy to get a read on. Sometimes he looks really good. Sometimes he doesn't. And then you got Phil Rowe, who I just, I haven't really been impressed with. Um, this is a guy that is what, um, three and two in the UFC, but you're looking at his wins and they're all come from behind wins. Every single one of them, the Orion Kosi fight, Kosi dominates him in the first round. Um, and then goes Kosi gasses out, which as expected, and then Roe knocks him out in the second. Against Jason Witt, same thing. Jason Witt dominates him in the first round. Uh, Jason Witt slows down, gets tired, and gets knocked out in the second. Nico Price was putting it on him pretty much the entire fight. Nico Price gets tired and gets knocked out. So he's like a come-from-behind Homer Simpson type fighter, and it's hard for me to, you know, to back fighters like that. Uh, the Neil Magny fight was terrible. I don't know what the heck happened there. Um, I felt like I guess you could have scored it for Roe, but neither guy did anything in that fight. It was it was awful. So yeah, I mean Jake Matthews, unlike Jason Witt, has durability. Jake Matthews, unlike Orion Kosi, has cardio. So that's the thing. I, Jake Matthews is the minute winner. This is a a classic minute winner versus moment winner type fight. Jake Matthews, if this fight goes to decision, I think he wins it. Um, doing the better work at range, um, landing more at range, and then also mixing in the takedowns. Phil Rose, take down defense is just non-existent. And then if this fight does finish, it's probably Rose. Probably Rowe landing a big shot. And you can tell that because Rowe has a 100% finish rate. He's never won a decision, and you can kind of see why. He's losing a lot of minutes. So I'm going to go with the who I think is the better minute winner here, who's going to be Jake Matthews. I think he does uh, better work on the feet, more volume. Um, and then also mixes in the t- takedowns and wins a decision. But like I said, I don't trust I don't trust Jake Matthews at all. But give me Jake to win this fight by decision, a fight I will not be touching. Next, we have Grant Dawson going against Joe Selecki, a fight I'm a lot more confident in here. We got Grant Dawson, 30 years old, 5'10", with a 72-inch reach, 22-1, and one, and 3-1-1 one one in his last five fights. Joe Selecki, 30 years old, 5'9", with a 70-and-a-half-inch reach, 13-4, and four, and 3-2, and two. In his last five fights, Durant Dawson, second biggest favorite on the card, uh, opened up minus 450, currently minus 415. Joe Selecki opened up plus 350, currently plus 345. I love this spot for Grant Dawson. Um, I've seen a lot of people say, like, you know, why is Grant Dawson this big of a favorite? And um, they were saying that back when he was, like, minus 300. Now he's minus 415. So this line keeps getting wider and wider, which kind of sucks because... I was going to look to maybe parlay him with something and never got to it. And I'm still going to find a way to play Dawson. There's a, there's a prop that I really like for Dawson here. Maybe you guys can kind of catch on. Um, but I love Dawson this matchup. I think wherever Joe Selecki is good, Dawson's just better. I think both these guys, obviously their striking is not great, but I think Dawson's striking is a lot better at this point. Dawson's striking, he's, he's making improvements in that striking. I think the biggest difference, though, is the wrestling. Grant Dawson, I think, is going to be the much better wrestler here. I think he's going to be able to to dictate where this fight takes place. I think if Grant Dawson gets on top of Joe Selecki, Selecki's staying there. I think if Grant Dawson gets to Selecki's back, he's staying there. Whereas if Joe Selecki was to take down Dawson, I think Dawson would be able to get back up. And um, I just think Dawson is going to be the much, much better fighter here, really wherever it goes. Joe Selecki, don't get me wrong, really good black belt, really good grappler. But, you know, I think he's going to be on his back a lot in this fight. I think he's going to be wearing Dawson a lot in this fight. And I think Dawson's going to kind of wear him down, break him down, and, and finish him late. So I like Dawson here. I like Dawson to get his his typical round three submission that he loves getting. He got it against Mark Matson. He got it against Jared Gordon. He got a uh, round three knockout against Leonardo Santos. And I think he kind of does the same thing here. I think he wears on Selecki puts him into bad spots, and eventually gets him out of there. If not, probably wins a dominant decision, 30-27. But yeah, I do like Grant Dawson in this fight, and I think there's a reason money's consistently coming in on him. I think people are parlaying this guy, and I, I don't I don't hate it. So give me uh, Grant Dawson here. I'll say round three submission. And then a prize picks play I like, and yeah, you probably think I'm crazy because I said I love Grant Dawson, but from a prize picks perspective, I love the, the, the less on the fantasy score. On prize picks, you do not get 
uh, fantasy points for control time, which is massive here in this fight because Grant Dawson's going to get a lot of it. I'm thinking 10 plus minutes even. And then also on prize picks, you do not get fantasy points for non-significant strikes, which on the ground, you're not going to get a lot of significant strikes. So um, I could see a situation where Dawson gets a third round finish or a decision and soars on the less. Unless it's an early finish, which that's not really Dawson's game. He never gets early finishes. So give me the less on the fantasy score for Grant Dawson there, a play that sticks out nice and early from a prize picks perspective. But we'll move on to the next fight. And this is going to be is this the yeah this is the feature yeah feature prelim and yeah what a what a featured prelim this is I remember earlier this year they had a featured prelim that was Jamie Pickett Eric Anders like like what were they possibly featuring there I, I I'm I'm still not sure but this is a a prelim that deserves to be featured because this fight's going to be freaking awesome we got Roman Kopilov going against Cesar Almeida we got Kopilov 33 years old six foot 75 inch reach 12 and three. And four and one in his last five fights. Cesar Almeida, 36 years old, six foot one with a 74 inch reach, five and zero and five and zero in his only five fights. Uh, so we have Kopilov opened up minus 175. He's now a pick of minus 110. Almeida opened up plus 150. He's currently a pick of minus 110. I think that Cesar Almeida is going to be the favorite very very soon. Um, I've seen nothing but Cesar Almeida bets, and. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think a pick em seems about right to me just because both these guys are very good strikers. You know, their opponents are always going to try to take them down. But in this fight here, they're just going to they're just going to stand and bang. Um, if anybody's going to, to shoot takedowns, it's going to be Kopilov. Kopilov has been living in Dagestan the last several years. But even then, I, I probably doubt that Cesar Almeida's takedown defense is honestly really good. I'm very impressed with the takedown defense. And on top of that, like the grappling. On the contender series, he was able to go out there and out grapple that that one dude, um, which I think was a brown belt. And yeah, his grappling looked a lot better than anticipated. And then Kopilov has elite takedown defense because he has to. I mean, both these guys have to. So yeah, both these guys are looking to keep it on the feet, and I think both these guys are going to stand and bang. I ever so slightly lean to the Kopilov side. I know Almeida. A lot of people like him. The big talking point is he beat Alex Pereira in a kickboxing fight. 11 years ago I guess that's that's the big talking point with the guy but that said though he is a really good striker he's a ton of power but I, I kind of like the style of Kopilov Kopilov is one of those guys who will more than often than not always lose the first round he more often than not he'll, he'll never finish anybody in the first round he has um, I think 11 knockouts only one of them come in the first round he's a guy that gets better and better as the fight goes on he's a guy that likes to invest into the body, into the legs, like in that Josh Frem fight, just invested to the body and broke him down. I love fighters like that, and that's Kopilov. He has a ton of finishes in the second and third round, and that's why. So Cesar Almeida, I think, is really live to potentially land a big shot in any round, but as this fight goes on, I think Kopilov can, can maybe wear down Almeida a little bit with those body shots, and I think Kopilov's live for a late finish here. So not a ton of confidence. I think a pick is about accurate, but I'm going to take Kopilov here to win this fight. I'm going to take him to win this fight by second round knockout. And what, like, this could be fight of the night. Like I said, these guys are going to stand and, and bang here. Moving on to the main card opener. We got Randy Brown going against Elizu Zaleski Dos Santos. We got Randy Brown, 33 years old, six foot three with a 78 inch reach, 18 and five and four and one in his last five fights. Elizu Zaleski. He is 37 years old, 5 foot 11 with a 73 inch reach, 24 7 and 1 and 3 1 and 1 in his last 5 fights. We have Randy Brown open up minus 170, currently minus 160. Zaleski open up plus 145, currently plus 140. And yeah, Zaleski, I think the reason this these odds are kind of closing up is because of Zaleski's last fight. He didn't win, uh but he got a draw, which I think was impressed a lot of people because a lot of people are very high on Renat Fakhradinov. And in that fight, Renat Fakhradinov won the majority of the fight, uh, but then got kind of gassed out and Zaleski ended up dominating him in the third round and ended up being a, a draw. So, but yeah, um, this is a fight where I, I like Brown here. You know, Brown's going to have a bunch of advantage in this matchup. He's going to be four years younger. I think that's huge. He's going to have a four-inch height advantage. He's going to have a five-inch reach advantage in this matchup. Um, he's a guy that has good cardio. He can go all three if need be. 
He has good takedown defense, good grappling in his own right. Just a very well-rounded fighter in Randy Brown. The only knock on Brown for me is he just can make fights a lot closer than they need to be at times. So maybe this fight could be close. But I'll never forget that Francisco Trinaldo fight where I, I, I put a big bet on, on Randy Brown at a at a big price tag, expecting him to go out there and make it look pretty easy, and he didn't. You know, that fight was a lot closer than it needed to be, and there's some other fights where it's like, you know, even the Wellington Terman fight was a lot closer than I expected it to be. Like, the striking uh, was a lot more uh, competitive than I expected it to be, and then even that, like, Chaos Williams fight, I'm not even sure he won that fight. So he can fight kind of close, but, you know, like I said, I, I think the the length, the reach, the, the height, the youth of Randy Brown is all going to be good here. The, the volume of Randy Brown as well. So I think he kind of jabs his way to a, to a 15-minute decision in this one. So I don't think it's going to be the most exciting fight, but I think Randy Brown can kind of dictate this fight, um, keep range, and, and win this fight by decision here. Moving on to the next fight. I love this fight. Uh, my, one of my favorite fights on the card. We got Jalton Almeida going against Alexander Romanov. We got Jalton Almeida, 32 years old, six foot three with a 79 inch reach, 20 and three and four and one in his last five fights. Romanov, 33 years old, six foot two with a 75 inch reach, 17 and two and three and two in his last five fights. We got Jalton Almeida is the favorite opened up minus 450, currently minus 255. Alexander Romanov opened up plus 350. He is currently a plus 215 underdog. And, yeah, I think it's a great spot here for Almeida to, to get back on track. Um, this is a step down in competition for Jonathan Almeida, a massive step down in competition. Going from Derek Lewis, Curtis Blades especially, to, you know, Alexander Romanov. And, man, Romanov is a, a weird fighter to kind of break down because this guy came in and he was on fire winning five fights in a row just looking extremely dominant taking guys down submitting them he has those hammer those king kong hammer fists that he likes to throw so there was some hype starting to build on romanov and yeah um that volkov fight was bad though and it was it was terrible and, it, and I'll, I'll admit it that was my worst bet of all time and i've had some bad bets you know i've i've laid shock on gina mazzani um, against Shanna Young, lost that. I, I laid a big ch uh, price tag on uh, Lupi Godinez against Angela Hill. I've had some, I've had some terrible bets, but this this one took the cake. You know, I bet Romanov against Volkov at minus one ten earlier in the week. It was on it was on that Sunday, and then Romanov shows up to the weigh-ins on Friday, and he looked to be in the worst shape of his life. It looked like he didn't even train once. And at that point, I knew my, my bet was was um, completely done. And I, ad, I ended up adding on to the under 2.5 because I thought there's no way this guy is, is going 12 and a half minutes. And that was the case. And it was a lot worse than I expected. Romanov went out there. He got a couple takedowns stuffed. And then he was visibly gassed out. And I mean like death gas, like nothing, nothing left in the tank. And it was crazy because I'm looking at Romanov and he's completely gassed. And then I look down at the clock. And there's still four minutes left in the first round. It was one of the worst displays of cardio I've ever seen, which which just tells me that I think Romanov is a great hammer. Great hammer. When he's in control, great hammer, but just a terrible nail. Like any adversity whatsoever, he's going to crumble. Like in the Volkov fight, in the Juan Espino fight, um, you know, kind of quit in that fight. Got the win, but, but he quit in that third round. So... I think if Jonathan Almeida is able to get on top of Romanov, the fight's going to be over shortly after because I don't, I don't think Romanov is going to have anything off his back. I think his ground game off his back is is terrible. Uh, we saw Juan Espino get into multiple dominant positions easily, like a like a hot knife through butter against Romanov. We saw Alexander Volkov uh, about take his back. Um, if if Jonathan Almeida is in that same spot, it's going to be bad. So. Yeah, I like I like Jalton here. I think Jalton has more than one minute of cardio, which I think favors him. And I know I know Romanov went 15 minutes in his last fight, but that was against Blagoy Ivanov, who just who just doesn't do anything. So um, give me Almeida here, and I think it's early. I think it's round one TKO. I think he's gonna pound away, and I think Romanov's gonna look for the door. So give me Jalton Almeida by first round knockout. I do want to see what shape, what kind of shape uh, Romanov is showing up in this this Saturday or this Friday. Um. And if so, if he does show up in bad shape, again, I'll probably just, like, smash the under because he, he looked awful in that Volkov fight. So, but, yeah, give me Jal Tomeda to win this fight by first round uh, TKO. Next, we have Kevin Holland going against Mikel Olazechuk. We got Kevin Holland, 31 years old, six foot three with an 81-inch reach, 25-11, and 2-3 and three in his last five fights. Mikel Olazechuk, 29 years old, six foot 
with a 74-inch reach, 19-7 and and 3-2 and in his last five fights. Kevin Holland is a decent-sized favorite. Opened up minus 210, currently minus 275. Mikel Olozajczuk opened up plus 170, currently plus 235. And I love this spot for Kevin Holland. Uh, I know it's always really tough to trust Kevin Holland. Holland probably has pound for pound the worst fight IQ I've ever seen in my entire life. But even Kevin Holland probably can't uh, F this one up against Mikhail Olazechuk. First and foremost, what I want to say is I don't know what's going on with Mikhail Olazechuk. Um, I was looking to actually bet Mikhail Olazechuk against Michelle Pereira. Thank God I didn't. But I was looking to maybe bet him against Michelle Pereira. And then I heard an interview basically saying that Mikhail Olszewski is not with a a team. He's not training with a team. He's training with like a couple buddies to save money, something like that. So it's like, is he even taking this serious? Like, it's not something I really want to hear. And ultimately, ended up passing and and good because he got finished in the first sixty seconds against Pereira. Now he's taking this fight on short notice. Both guys are. I think this fight was made like maybe three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, if that. You know, has he found a, a gym um, since then? Is he is he working with the team, or or is he just training on his own? I don't know. But uh, altogether, I just think you know that that aside, we can throw that t- to the side. I think it's a tough matchup for Ola Zaychuk. Ola Zaychuk, I'm, I don't think he has more than you know five to seven and a half good minutes of cardio, whereas Kevin Holland does. I think durability is massively in favor of Kevin Holland. Uh, Mikhail Olazechuk gets finished in pretty much all of his losses. Six out of seven losses for Mikhail Olazechuk will come inside the distance. Uh, I don't trust the durability of Olazechuk, the heart. Um, I think he looks for ways out. He's been submitted six times. So, yeah, I like Holland here. He's going to be much bigger. He's going to have a three-inch height advantage on paper, but I think it's going to be more like a six-inch height advantage because I don't believe that Olazechuk's six foot. I think he's more so 5'10". Uh, massive reach advantage. Kevin Holland shouldn't shouldn't mess it. If, if Kevin Holland loses this fight, it's going to be the worst loss in his entire career. Because look at these losses: Michael Venom Page, great great loss, great fighter. Jack Della Maddalena, great great fighter, and that was a close fight. That was a very close fight. Stephen Thompson, great fighter. Hamzat Shemaev, great fighter. Marvin Vittori, great fighter. Derek Brunson. At the time, was it was a pretty good fighter. Uh, Brendan Allen, good fighter. And then Tiago Santos, pretty good fighter. So, yeah, I mean, this would be the worst loss by a country mile. It would be really embarrassing. So, yeah, I got to go Holland here. And I think Holland can beat him any which way, decision, knockout, or submission. But I think that club and subs live. You know, Mikhail Olazechuk, um gets submitted all the time. So, I think Kevin Holland, Kevin Holland breaks him down. Maybe the first round's close. But uh, after that, I think Holland starts to put it on him and eventually finishes him second round club and sub. Moving on to the co-main event. Five-round fight, Sean Strickland, Paulo Costa. We got Strickland, 33 years old, 6'1", with a 76-inch reach, 28-6, and six, and 3-2 and two in his last five fights. Paulo Costa, 33 years old, 6'1", with a 72-inch reach, 14-3, and 3-2 three, and three and in his last five fights. We got Sean Strickland opening up minus 200, currently minus 240. Paulo Costa opening up plus 170. He's currently a plus 205 underdog. And first look, I'm like, man, I think Costa is a very live dog. And then I saw that it's five rounds, and I'm like, absolutely not. Um, the five round thing, I mean, that that heavily favors Sean Strickland. He- I mean, it heavily favors him. Because Sean Strickland's a guy that, first of all, he's been five rounds like a million times at this point. Yeah, he'll never slow down in a fight that takes place on the feet. I mean, this guy spars all the time for for hours at a time. You got to imagine he's never going to slow down. Whereas Paulo Costa, he does slow down. He gets very tired. His best work is early on. So it's like a tale of two fighters. Like Sean Strickland probably loses the first, but it's, you know he's going to get better as the fight goes on. Whereas Paulo Costa is probably going to win the first, but he's going to kind of taper off as the fight goes on. Every second that that goes by, it's just going to favor Sean Strickland more and more. So, yeah, since it is a five-round fight, I'm I'm picking Sean Strickland here, and I'm picking him to win by decision. Sean Strickland doesn't have much power, does not have much finishing ability at all, and Paulo Costa is a tough dude. I, I, maybe Sean Strickland can get him out of there late if he's completely gassed out, but yeah, Costa is Costa's a tough guy. I think this fight's going five. And I'll take Sean Strickland here. I think it could be close, though, because Sean Strickland has had, like, a ton of, like, really close split decision type main event fights, like the Drikas, the Cannoneer, so on and so forth, right? 
Um, so there could be a scenario where Sean Strickland's landing a lot more volume, but Paulo Costa is landing that one big shot. And we know with the crooked Krupp judges, they can kind of screw it up as well. But how I'm thinking this plays out is Sean Strickland loses the first, Sean Strickland builds into the fight and wins at, at least the third, fourth, and fifth. So give me Sean Strickland by decision. I think Sean Strickland as a live bet makes a lot of sense, and I'll be looking at that. But uh, yeah, Sean Strickland by decision for me in this Komen event. And then finally, we have the main event. If you guys have not, comment down how many significant strikes you think that these two are going to combine for this Saturday. But we got Islam Mahachev going against Dustin Poirier. We got Islam, 32 years old, 5'10", with a 70.5-inch reach, 25-1, and 5-0 and and in his last five fights. Dustin Poirier, 35 years old, 5'9", with a 73-inch reach, 30-8, and eight, and 3-2 and two in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds, and I'm kind of surprised. Uh, Islam opened at minus 600. He's currently minus 700. Dustin Poirier opened up plus 425. He's currently plus 500. And what I'll say is nothing is wrong with, with passing. Nothing's wrong with passing on a fight, which I will be doing from a money line standpoint. There's there's a, a prop or two I like. But from a money line standpoint, you you don't lay minus 700 on Islam Mahachev. But at the same time, you know, Dustin Poirier plus 500, it's enticing. It is. It's very enticing. But I kind of feel like the the books want you to do that. They want you to, oh, Dustin Poirier is a, a big dog. They want you to take a shot on him because there, there is, he's probably not winning the fight. Let's just let's just keep it real. He's probably not winning this fight. I think it's a really tough matchup for him. Um, I think Islam should be a favorite. Should be minus 700. I don't know about all that, but I think he should be a pretty big favorite. And I'm just not sure what Dustin's path is outside of a puncher's chance. I mean, is he going to, you know, jump Gilly? Yeah, he will jump Gilly. Is he going to get it? No, he's not. Um, and if this is, is this fight going to take place on the feet for a good portion? Probably not. I mean, if Islam wants to take down Dustin Poirier, he'll be able to, to take down Dustin. I, I don't, I don't see a scenario where that, that just doesn't happen. Anytime, you know, somebody's tried to take down Dustin, they typically have success. Like even in the Benoit St. Denis fight, Benoit St. Denis took him down three times, was able to get into some really dominant positions, got in a mount at one point. Um, but luckily for Dustin, I mean, Benoit St. Denis gassed out like six minutes in, and Dustin was able to knock him out. But there were some pretty bad moments against Benoit St. Denis. Against Michael Chandler, Ch Dan Chandler takes him down three times. Chandler's able to control him. Chandler's able to get in some pretty dominant spots. It's like, you know, that's not, not a good look. Uh, of course, we don't remember Habib taking him down seven times and, and submitting him. Uh, Charles Oliveira took him down in the second round, controlled him the entire round. Third round comes around. Charles takes the back and subs him shortly after. It's just anytime somebody grapples this guy, and he's a black belt, they just they have a ton of success doing so. Islam's not going to gas out in six minutes like Benoit. Um, you know, Islam's going to be able to get takedowns. He's going to be able to get into dominant positions. And I think he's going to finish this fight in the second round. So um, I got to go Islam Mahachev, minus 700. No hot take from me here. I think he makes this look quite dominant. Dustin Poirier is talking about retirement. He said win or lose, there's a good chance he retires this fight. You, you don't like to hear that. So, yeah, I think Islam wins this fight, retains that belt, and does it with a submission in the second round. So, yeah, guys, there you guys have it. Thank you all so much for watching. If you guys could, please do me a favor. Like the video on your way out. Subscribe to the channel as well. Looking to keep the ball rolling. It was kind of a slow start to the year, but it's starting to build momentum, starting to circle the Wackens. Had a, a winning April, had a winning May, and looking forward to hopefully a winning June. Three bets on the card already, and I'm looking at a lot of spots. There's a lot of spots sticking out for this card. Um, and, yeah, looking to, to keep the, the ball rolling here. So, Best of luck, everybody, for UFC 302. Be on the lookout for more content throughout the week, betting, DraftKings, prize picks, all the good stuff. And best of luck, guys. We'll talk to you soon. See you.